Good morning. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> well, from Jeremiah, we're going to get a view of Christ's hope. You see, no one can live without hope. Hope is the energy that makes the future possible. Hope is the antidote to despair. Hope is to life what wind is to fire. It is the one essential ingredient if people are to construct a new life for themselves. In these beautiful, beautiful verses of Jeremiah, we catch something of the prophet's energy of hope for his people. Terrible things have been happening in Israel. The institution has become dis destroyed. Families have been uprooted and displaced. Old securities have melted into fires of historical chaos and despair is the order of the day. The exile to Babylon is, well, it's depicted as nothing is left in Israel's life would ever be the same. The glorious worship of the temple, gone forever. The bright, secure days of Israel life under strong kings seemed like a distant past. The people are languishing in the foreign land, the songs of their heart forever silenced by the lament of despair and lone longing. Into the brink condition comes a strong word from the prophet Jeremiah to the exile. God is going to do a mighty work of restoration. The place where you are, are right now is not the final place of your life. Look and see, listen and hear. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with children, those in labor, together. A great company. They shall return here. Jeremiah 31, verse 8. The prophecy is an energized word for a desperate people in what appears to be a hopeless situation. It's always critical to have someone speak the word of hope. Paul wrote about faith, hope, and love, and said that the greatest of these three is love. No one would argue that. But in some moments in life, and for some people, the greatest word is the word of hope. It is the mission of Jeremiah to speak this word to his people to create and with forcefulness as he can. His ministry in this text today offered guidance to the church as it proclaimed the faith of Christ to the world. There is no higher calling for you and me. No higher calling than to proclaim the faith of Christ. And more, no better work, holy work that we can do to speak of hope to a hurting, confused, and lost people. That's our society today, and that's what we need to do. 
just as Jeremiah did for his people back then. The spirit of Christmas is found in Jeremiah's promise of restoration. It says in 13, I will turn their mourning into joy. I will conform them and give them gladness for sorrow. You see, into the world laden with the heaviness and the senseless activity and the endless consumption has come the word of hope in a new way of living. No longer do we have to toil for that which does not satisfy and live for that which is not permanent. A new word has been spoken and indeed has been born and we are invited to embrace it and let it embrace us. A life will be different because of what God has done in Bethlehem. Perhaps the best way for the church to use this text of Jeremiah on this second Sunday after Christmas is to remember and remind itself of the ministry of a hopeful proclamation. If we want to grow as a church, that's what we have to do, a hopeful proclamation. We have experienced something that the world, well, may not perceive. God has come in Christ, making all things new. Our proclamation should be a creative and bold as we dare to make it, as we direct our lives to restore the fountain of grace. Is it vital and important for someone to be able to perceive the not yet, the hope that is still unseen, and paint a picture that, well, is dawning today for those weighted down by the present situation and circumstances. Those who speak such words offers a ministry that has the power to revitalize people and bring new shape to the present reality. It is it, well, it has been suggested that when beginning such significant work, one should always have an ending in mind. It is, it is against the vision of what is ultimately desired that all work is done in order to arrive at a desired outcome. Jeremiah is speaking words about the end of the exile of his people. It is not yet realized, but now the people have a vision that what the ending will look like. They are energized to live creative is so sure and confident hope that God will restore their lives. Such a vision of the church in this season of Christ, Christmas tide, from such vision we dare in the work of the hymn to live tomorrow like today. In her book, At Home at Mitfield, Jane Cran wrote of the time when Father Tim, an Episcopal priest, heard a horrible scream from his sanctuary in his church. As he came closer, he began to understand the anguish words which were made up the scream. 
Are you up there? Well, Father Tim slipped into a pew alongside and knelt it on a worn cushion. You may be asking the wrong question, he said quietly. Startled was the man who raised his head. I, I believe the question you want to ask is not, are you up there? But are you down here? Are you down here? What an appropriate question for this time when our celebration of the birth of our Savior has been, well, behind us now. For a few weeks, we focused on the nearness of God, Emmanuel, God is with us. But now, as we move back into our daily routine, the thought of Christ are often discarded with the used wrapping paper or boxed up the nativity scene to be brought out next year. God once again retreats to the heaven. No more word that dwell among us full of grace and truth. John Gospel tells us to remember, however, that the Word was made flesh and dwell among us. This Word, the Word that was in the beginning, the Word that was with God, the Word that was God, because something we can grasp. Christ, the Word, certainly is up there. But we must never forget that He is also down here. We can see that Christ is dwelling with us still. If only to ask the right question and look in the right place. It is these continuing Occupy, occupying of the incarnation that we must seek if we are not taking for granted our lives as children of God. How can we see the eternal in the mundane? To see the word made flesh, we must realize that all of life can be a sacrament. We must fill way, find ways to transform our daily routine as a conveyor to God's truth and grace. Perhaps we do this by being aware of the gift of the things which fills our days. If we pray a prayer of thanksgiving for our car each time we place it, the key in the ignition. Perhaps the rush hour traffic may seem less burdensome. If we say grace, not only over meals, but also over our work, perhaps we will begin to see our chores as gift from a loving God. If we celebrate the transitions of our lives, such as retirement, birthdays, relocation, perhaps we'll see more clearly how God works in those things. Even more important, we must learn to see our relationship as a sacrament. Humans are created in God's image. Therefore, we must, well, we should more clearly be able to see God in each other. How would life change if we made a special effort 
for everyone we meet would feel better than they did before we met. What would happen if we secretly did nice things to friends and strangers, seeing how much good we can do without getting caught? Maybe we would see the word become flesh, not only for them, but also for ourselves. The sacred moments when the eternal touch the temporary, it leaves a permanent mark on all who experience them. If you look for God down here, we will be able to say truly that like John, we have seen the glory of God. The word, the glory of God, is continually being made flesh, revealing God to us. The darkness has not overcome the light, and the sun, who is the closest to God, heart. He's close to God's heart. Continue to make himself known to us in the flesh. Amen.